Hey everybody, welcome back to the Drawing Database. Uh, Mark Leone here, Professor Mark Leone. And uh, we're going to get started with another long pose. And I thought I'd show you a couple things for this one. This one's a little bit, this uh, uh, drawing will be in a French academic uh, style, kind of a Degas uh, style in the 19th century, middle to late part of the 19th century. And we're going to work in graphite. So I've got uh, graphite pencils here. And I've also got a mechanical pencil. I, uh, the other ones I had were in my uh, office studio up at the university, and I can't really go there. And I've got some leads, some 3B, some softer leads for that, and then some really soft leads here, 6B in the graphite pencils, and also some B a little bit uh, lighter. And I've got the sharpener for the mechanical pencil. I like to use the mechanical pencil too as well. But then also, again, the stump, which we've seen in other drawings, or at least the longer term with the tone paper, and of course sandpaper for it. And you can see where you can sand this stump and get it back clean and also kind of give it a point too as well later on. Um, and so that's important to keep it clean. Since we're going to be using, I'm going to be using graphite for this drawing, we want to make sure our stump uh, it was already clean, but I just want to clean it to show you, and, and only keep it for graphite. Um, if you, you so buy more than one type of uh, stump or, or uh, blending stump, these are just paper, and um, keep it for that material only. So if you're using charcoal for stumping, use it just for charcoal, and then buy others for graphite and, and other materials, and that will help you out. Now, <clears throat> the other thing is for this drawing I'm using a, a, a specialty paper, a little finer paper than just the sketch paper that I normally have my students use. Uh, and then we use these for longer poses. This is a Reeves, a BFK Reeves. BFK Reeves, um, lovely uh, cotton paper. You can see it's not particularly thick, but it's more, uh, uh, still, still processed and machine made, but more handmade. And it's just a richer surface to draw on. And it works really nicely with uh, also stumping. So I'll show you here um, stumping technique a little bit further if you're not as familiar with it. So we lay down a uh, uh, graphite tone here nicely on the paper. It picks up a nice little little texture, a little lovely texture there. And then we can take our stump here, paper stump, and then we can start to blend that down very nicely. And take that back a little bit and smooth that out. So the paper has these peaks and valleys a little bit, right? Kind of like, I'll just draw it, kind of like this, peak and a valley, okay? So obviously the peak, right, in the valley there. And then as, you, as you're drawing on that surface, when you turn your pencil to the side, like you'll probably want to. See, I'm holding my pencil in a conductor uh, technique, meaning I'm conducting an orchestra, right? So far away from the drawing lead or the material, the graphite. And as it rubs on the surface there, as you notice, it has the kind of a grating look to it. So it's got some dark areas where it's hitting these areas of the peak, but it doesn't get in the trough there. And so that's what the stump does. The stump blends it into all of the areas. You can work back and forth, side to side, or in a circle. What, you know, what I'm not doing is pressing down on the paper very hard. I'm very lightly working over the paper so that the, uh, we don't make any large depressions into the paper. You can see how that blends quite, quite nicely. The only problem sometimes is it's hard to control the blending on the edges and you'll need erasers for that. But then you could come back and sketch back on top of that and go a little bit darker, which has a nice look to it. So you get a stump look and a drawn look on top of the stump quite nicely. And so that's a nice technique to continue to work with. And then of course you could build up that dark with the stump. And notice that it's dirty on this side clean on that side. You can keep it that way or you can have both working dirty for you. 
and then we can still stump here and see if that, that's a nice blending through there. Right in through there. And you can keep going with it. You can build it up to be super dark too as well. And then you can add just additive tone to it here. Right, and continue to go darker if you want. And that kind of looks nice when you draw back over that. It integrates it more. Another thing you can do when this gets uh, dirty enough, you can actually sketch with it. See, I can make sketchier lines with it, and you can lay down, you know, a little line work. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't work forever because that stuff comes off, but it's actually doing pretty well. And then you can actually just use the stump to start a light tone. So you could actually work with your stump right off the bat if it's dirty or what you might want to do. If you like doing that, what I would suggest is do something like this uh, and practice with it, but get it pretty dirty, meaning that I could take that and then turn the stump more to the side, kind of roll it around and see how I can get that covered more in graphite. And smooth that out, continue to smooth that out. <clears throat> And see how it's dirtier all over, and then you can come back and draw with it <clears throat> as well. And of course, there's powdered graphite on the market. You can buy a jar of powdered graphite. It's basically, I don't have any with me now, but this, this material, the graphite, just ground up. You know, graphite is an earth mineral based in carbon, which is an element, but it's an earth mineral. It's produced all over the world, but especially in China. Um, and then it's ground super fun. It has obviously graphite has a very greasy quality to it. Now, see how I was drawing with the stump, and I didn't use any pencil beforehand. And so you can do that, but it doesn't last forever because it kind of starts to take it all off. But you get the idea there. Now, this is a 6B pencil, so that's already pretty soft already. When you when I lay that down in the the lighter the pencil that you use, the less dark it will be when you stump it down as well. So that's something to think about. But anyway, that is the stumping technique that we'll be using. Now you could use not just a cardboard stump. Those are pretty standard, but you could use a brush, uh, smaller brushes, or you could use a Q-tip or a device that you clean out the canals of your ear with, right? And that's that's a possibility too as well. So we see the see the stump technique, and then let me grab an eraser, needed eraser over here, and then you could say this is a side of a leg or something. You could tighten up the edge with the needed eraser and or the white erasers, and just take them. See how I can erase back into that nicely. Or I can dab at it, take that off quite nicely. It comes off pretty nice, lightens up like so. It gives it a very soft erasing. Then, if you wanted more, you could come back and use like a Japanese mono eraser. Over here, I've got. I've got one. I need to clean it off a little bit. So see how it's dirty here? Right now I can take my uh, my sharpener here and see how I can clean that up nicely. I keep some extra sharpening pads here. These are nitrum, by the way, nitrum pads. They go on my big sharpener, which is, oops, here it is over here. Here's my nitrum sharpener. Pretty dirty, but you can see that you can take these off. They stick on. You can pull them off. I just like to keep them individually like so. And then of course you can uh, clean these out a little bit. I'm glad I could show you this actually. And you can clean these out. <clears throat> clean up the shavings a bit. You never want to shave your, your um, erasers over your final drawing obviously. And then you can take your needed, your uh, Japanese mono and come back in there nice. You see how I can get that all cleaned down. And I'm not pushing down very hard. Okay, this paper is pretty soft, so you have to be, oh, excuse me, a little careful with it. 
and see how I can get that edge and tighten that edge, make a shape out of it, whatever that's going to be. So I would experiment a little bit if you've never used graphite to stomp and play around with that too. See how you can you can work that edge. You can draw into it a little. There we go. It's starting to get a little dirty already, so I have to clean off that tip a little bit, but you get the idea. Most of the time you'll be taking out just a little bit here and there, so you get the idea there as well. Alright, so that's that's kind of the technique that we'll be using for our uh, French academic style stump in graphite. All right, so here we are now with the, uh, the, the drawing here, and I'm going to add now um, <clears throat> the uh, hand there, because I forgot the, the, finger, the fingers here. So let's add those in uh, quickly here, get those all lined up. And then we're going to block in this uh, drawing with graphite tone. Do a block in of that. Take um, the number the B pencil that I have here, which is not too hard, it's not too soft, but uh, it's kind of nice right in the middle. And that's essentially what I use the whole time. Sorry, I've got a mint in my mouth. I shouldn't have done that, but I'm going to let it roll anyway. Keeping it real here at the drawing database. <laughs> let me crunch down on it and get rid of peppermint here. Um, and so I use the number the the, the, the B pencil um, for pretty much just about all of it. I think I use a six B just a little bit in the mechanical pencil, but not a whole lot. So on this this special specialty paper, the Reeves BFK, um, it, it's more absorbent and can really take on more graphite and can get dark. So, which is really pretty nice. You know, I'm just laying on the fingers on top of the of the, the forearm there, nothing special. We don't want to get every nail, every detail, but we do want to feel the fingers as volumetric blocks. That's more important, their structure, rather than um, anything else. Let's pull in tighter in there, and you can see that for a moment. There we go, that's a much better view. Get in there and closer a little bit and see what's going on. So, try to think of those finger digits, those uh, uh, metacarpals there as blocky forms are slightly turned towards us, but have they have a, a top and a little bit of a side to them there. We won't go, go into great detail because it's not needed. That's something that you've got to be aware of is that hold off on detailed areas that you don't, you don't need uh, quite as much on. And that could be hands and feet later on. You can see that in some of the master studies where it's not important. And then when you do close-ups of some of these 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 uh, features, then you go into greater greater detail with uh, a larger uh, space. So again, laying in laying in the hands here. And if I make a you know a, a pretty poor error, then I'll I'll change it as best I can. <clears throat> so hopefully you found the first part of the um, video uh, interesting and challenging enough with contour line. And this is a fairly lighter contour line. This could go darker if we need to. If it was only going to be contour line exclusively, then we could we could really darken them in and get to a much more satisfying kind of ending contour line. But this is a nice one to keep it a little bit lighter because we're going to go full value and uh, ultimately render out and finish the uh, head and torso down to around the middle buttock. I figured that was enough for the time frame that we have. And you can take the rest of it, and you can take what's been finished, either finish the rest of it or start your own if you like this particular style and methodology. So that finger works pretty well as it lays across across the top. And you'll see me once I add tone down there, I'll take even that detail that you see now and loft a little bit and make it just a uh, more silhouetted kind of shadow pattern. And you can see where the next knuckle overlaps there. through there. <clears throat> you can see my I have to get my body in different ways to get out of the camera's way. It makes it challenging. Kind of drawing it sideways. Don't do this at home. <laughs> you won't have to draw it straight on. But I have to get out of the camera way a little bit.
It's a little bit of that nail coming through. You can see my beat up thumb there. I put a drywall screw through that thumb about five years ago and it never grew back properly. I think one day I'll have to have it pulled. That'll be a fun, fun process, I'm sure. So getting that overlap. See where they overlap a little bit right there? I'll make a little bit darker to show that. Just a little bit of the nail. And I've probably, I think I take the nail out even in the detail. They're just really not that important in this sizing. If we were doing a close-up of the hands, well, yes, of course, the nail would be important. So you have to, you know, look at a lot of master drawings, number one, of... Um, you know, from the Renaissance and Baroque, etc., and, and see how they handle some of these positions over time. They don't have to render every every single thing out. <clears throat> and that's probably even too much what I'm doing, but ultimately I think it's good to see, see how the these forms work. Next finger on top of that. It's a really delicate tiny area. There's trying to think about drawing little boxes. The, the fingers are little box positions and make sure I get their flow and their, their gesture correct. But in my mind, so I'm not drawing the, the kind of rhythmic gesture, but I have to keep it in my head and it takes more thinking. I think David Hockney talked about that when he was doing, or maybe still doing, some of his ink drawings. They were uh, single line drawings, and he said these he talked about that technique. It had was so ex ex exhaustive because you have to think and hold so much information in your mind. You know, when we teach drawing, we teach gesture in a volumetric figure, and then you leave those gestures down there, and you draw on top of it, and you can go, you know, have a glass of milk and have a cookie or or, you know, a cigar and some whiskey, whatever your poison is, right? <laughs> um, and you can come back and you can draw right on top of what you have. When you don't, you have to make sure that that model's there and gets in that position back and then can, can, can settle in because you really have to keep the thinking there alive even, even further there. So where that finger overlaps that forearm there, that little side plane is going to go a little darker where that shadow is. We'll push that right there. Like put put that crevasse back in there. It's really important to get that overlap. Where you know you have contour lines where there's overlap, like under the ear, the, the jaw there, or you have uh, areas that are touching one another. That's going to be important too. So you can kind of see the whole the whole things emerging through there. Just put that little pinky on just the top. And I actually was never satisfied with the, with the hand, the raised hand, all the way up. I actually changed it a couple of times. In the final drawing, I changed it actually after what was done and off camera. I actually made it more, even more slender. It was just too wide and too long. It seems to be working out pretty well there. So I cut back. Uh, finish it up. It, it Don't copy that because it's still too big. So I don't want you to copy that. I'm going to make it it's a little bit smaller. Still, I don't like it. So now I'm blocking in. So we can start here. I'm blocking in graphite. So I'm taking the, my pencil, holding it to the side, the conductor method. You can see that and I'm glossing over all of my shadow shapes now. from Starting from top downward, being pretty systematic with it. And I'm not going too dark, not too heavy, but I'm, I'm putting a much, much lighter value. It will wind up being about the value of the lightest reflected light. See the reflected light on her forearm, um, behind, on top of the fingers there, or in the elbow, or in her head area, on her arm closer to the head. See how that's a lighter? So that's the basic kind of light blocking. Now I've, you've seen this done on several other videos if you've if you've been watching the figure and just different techniques, this is the French uh, academic contour line in, in 19th century, 18th century um, academic kind of style of graphite. And so 
Same kind of thing, just laying that down, blocking that in, and laying over the fingers. And so we're just finding our shadow pattern, and we're start start to what I call kind of glazing or lightly toning that in. And then we get a better close up so you can get in there and see that. You can see where I'm blocking in from the fingers to the elbow and I'm reaching into the elbow a little bit to get the dimples of the elbow there and glossing over the fingers to put them in shadow. Don't worry about all the details in there yet. We're going to simplify that a little even further. <clears throat> the thumb, don't forget the thumb, there we go, got the thumb in there, that's working pretty well. You get those dimples by those little extensor flexor areas of the elbow, or the olecranon, or the, the uh, joint of the ulna radius and the humerus, which is a fascinating joint by the way, it's a kind of a spool joint then kind of a C-shaped joint, C-cup joint too. There's two of them. One of the most unique areas, because you've got torquing and twisting and you've got a pivot, sort of pivot joint there with the, with that area. So it's fascinating. Forearm to, to wrist joint there. So that's starting to work pretty well as a, as a general basic uh, graphite block. And we can see the figure illuminating here. We know that the light source is from the left. She's kind of staring we told her, don't you know? Don't look in the light. Don't. As we, she took this pose, don't 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 blind yourself. But and then of course it didn't. We, she didn't have to hold it very long. But she's looking up just slightly with her eyes a little bit or closed. But the light source is hitting her right in the front, which makes a nice kind of side light for her, and gives her 50/50 lighting. So she's about half lit on the left, and then half in shadow with some nice reflected light back there, which makes we've got a little little bit of ref reflector light going on outside of the camera just a touch, just to lighten her back up a little bit. And so that's why you see that core shadow. It's a very common way to light the model and, and, and something that was figured out really in the early to middle Renaissance and, and really perfected in the Renaissance and Baroque is that that core shadow, that, that darkest tone there, that kind of banded light, that soft, to give the model about half light and half shadow. And then, and then of course, Caravaggio came along and, and kind of changed with his strong chiaroscuro and made everything super dark and, and kind of grouped uh, the background and the foreground shadow together and kind of eliminated some of the the, um, the core shadow and made what I call kind of the comic book lining where it's real real dark and angular. So now I'm working with the background tone. So you're going to see me, if you've skipped ahead and you've seen the final, which you know I always do that in the kind of video that I'm, I'm watching, um, is, and I'll talk while I'm off camera here is uh, we want background tone even in our study to set off the model from the uh, 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 from the background and so this helps to put some starting some tone where are the focal points going to be if you're just doing you know part of the figure we want the focal point at the head that's important and also to uh, illuminate the lighter side of the model if we didn't have any shadow back there just guy would hurry up and sharpen his pencil and get back over. And there we go. Give thumbs up. Thank you, sir. There we go. And this, what this does is it gives a little bit of contrast on the uh, background against her uh, light to illuminate. Without it, we we'll, didn't uh, use any background. Uh, the light source on the model is going to feel not as illuminated um, as well. So remember the Oreo cookie ideas is uh, very, very important there. So we're going to block that in and we're going to be mindful of our design as well. So we'll, you know, you'll see that as it emerges. We're not going to go you know, too, too overly crazy with the all of the background. We want enough there to trap the model. We'll get a little bit of the socket just showing through of our eyelid. It's kind of dark. It's right on the cr cr uh, cusp there. I chose this one because it's not a particularly difficult pose with a lot of head detail or hand detail. Um, so it makes it a little bit easier for you. And for me too, quite frankly. And we'll get in there, noodle into that tip of the head. We want to get all the way up to the edge 
of the drawing that we're making. We don't want to leave a little halo around the, the outline. That's a no-no. We want to bring that edge, the tone, all the way up to the edge. See how I draw for a while and then I'll, I'll pick it up and turn my pencil and every time I pick it, I'll twirl it. See how I twirl it? And the reason why is, is I don't want it to hit the same point for too often because it starts to chisel it. If you're doing a lot of gesture drawing, like that happened to me, I'll do a lot of gesture drawing to warm up and then I'll use soft, extra soft charcoal pencils and they'll start to, after a while, they'll start to chisel on one side so it makes a kind of triangular divot and, um, and ultimately once you get out of that divot it, it, it's not good on the other side so I, it happens if you draw long enough. Remember drawing on paper is like drawing on a micro cheese grater. It's got texture to, to, so the pencil will pick it up. It's like it peaks and valleys. And so that by just picking up your pencil and when you pick it up, just twirl a little bit. It's not sharpening it, but it's keeping it even and balanced on, on all, uh, all sides. If you can't do it, don't worry about it. It's not, a big, it's not a big deal. It's just something I'm doing. I just thought I'd let you know. So you get rewarded if you watch the whole video and the narration part of it and you draw with it too. So <laughs> it'll help. So you can see a nice block in it. She's emerging now. We've got a um, uh, detail. We've got some likeness, likeness going on, and you know, and we're still in the earlier stages. So we're going to take this graphite, lay in, block in, and then we're going to stump it. it. Means that we're going to blend it a little bit, kind of a painterly approach, and that's going to going to make it a little bit darker and smoother. And then we're going to, and then in the final video, we're going to draw over that stumped part to give it its final pass. One thing about this paper, it's it's a little it's a little textured, and sometimes in finite detail, like around her lip a little bit, it's hard to get around. If you've got a couple of bumps there, it kind of gives you an extra little bit of a lip on the edge, which is fine. But sometimes it's a little unruly. But it's not a very I mean, it's not a highly highly textured paper, but it is a Reeves BFK. It's got a little bit. It's not a water heavy watercolor paper, which is really like a cheese grater. Just mindful of the edge, bringing that tone over to the chin there. I always fantasized about doing some of these narrations of the drawing like a soccer, like a World Cup final soccer match with yelling and screaming. I'm not sure where the goal would be, but maybe like when the head's done I could yell goal just to keep 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 everybody alive. Because even I get I get a little sleepy sometimes when I do these. If you go back and look at some of my other videos, if you watch them, hopefully you have. If not, that's okay. And you, when I narrow it, I get a little tired at the end, and sometimes I feel... I was showing my wife one day, and she started giggling. She's like, you sound so sleepy. <laughs> if, you didn't, if, you, if you knew me, you'd know that I'm giving away my trade secrets. So I, I try to do these like in an hour, an hour and a half at a time, and then and take a break or do them the next day. So some little trade secret there. You probably don't care. I get it. I totally get it. So we can see now that she's emerging quite well. We have a good rudimentary light and dark, good edge quality going. We'll work on just slowing this down. Notice I'm keeping my, it's hard to tell, I'm keeping my hand off the paper. I've got a little triangle that I'm holding it on. You've got to be careful. You've got to know where your hands are at. And I keep my hands for this style of drawing super duper clean. So I wash my hands, I wash my tools. Not the pencil so much, but the uh, the uh, uh, hard edge, the triangle, or rate, uh, ruler if I need it. Uh, anything that might lay on top of that, I, I'll use soap and water from time to time and clean that off. And you want to clean off your hands. You don't want to have any smudging uh, on your hands for this type of drawing. Other drawings can be really messy and sloppy, and, and that's totally fine. Totally fine. So I'm not an orthodox um draftsman in any any way shape or form I love to experiment and may, essentially my whole career has been part of part of that if you look at my my personal work markleoneartist.com <clears throat> just coming over the breast form there not really thinking about the the curtain behind there not, as a matter of fact I'm not looking at it at all I'm just, I know the tone that I want to put down, take a couple of passes here. 
So getting underneath that breast form, that delicate teardrop shape as it gravity pulls, curves around. So I, what I did there is just, just gracefully kind of uh, reset the edge a little bit. Then I can lay more graphite uh, back on top of that tone there. Right on top of the pectoral there, that's the, the far lateral side of that pectoral. You can see how far it goes up and then it attaches to the humerus right around the same place as the deltoid does. The shoulder area, girdle area, the, the deltoid, the pectoral, and the bicep. It's a fascinating area as it comes together. It's a really telltale sign, but you know, defines the armpit. So we get some of that here a little bit in the French kind of style. So underneath now the breast form. Get up to those edges. Nice and consistent tone throughout. Put a little tone there and you can see that emerging. <clears throat> Dip into to the, her anatomy there just a bit. And we'll move it down a little bit so we can see a little better. So we'll keep going under the breast a little bit further down to about the abdomen belly region. A little. I'm not very aggressive with the pencil stroking. I'm going to go a little bit dark with that triangle as of the shadow made by the curtain under the breast a little bit. Just to set that off a little further. What we're doing, the purpose of all this is to begin to obviously illuminate the model but give us a roadmap to the design not only with the background but also with the shadow shapes to see them in their beginning layered stages and then of course we'll come back and add core shadow after we've stumped it so so, so once you do this all the the graphite um, lay-in or block-in it's going to be I think really if you've never stumped before I think you're going to be in for a nice treat and I'll talk about you know easing off that stump it's like brakes on a car you don't want to go or, or a uh, gas pedal you want to do, you want to blast it you want to ease into it very softly gently just getting the stump excuse me getting the graphite down to the abdomen keeping that line get on down there to the lower abdomen probably <laughs> You know, it's kind of like a coloring book in a way, but a really nice, sophisticated one. I'm not trying to make the tone completely even. It's a little modulation is fine. You can see all the different values that's going on up there. As we also saw the early Degas with, with different value shifts in the background. Backgrounds are important as a design. You're a designer. I tell my students at school here at NKU that they're designers. They're designing the model. They're not copying, but we're making an analysis of movement and shape and form and the figure, but also the design of the, the model, too, as well. So let me get in a better position here. And I'm going to put another pass on the hair just a little bit darker. I'm going to leave her hair just a little bit lighter than ultimately what she has. And then in my own drawing, I actually lighten up the back of it to get a little reflective line. But I wanted to be, you know, fairly accurate to the photo. But if you, you know, if you guys have studied with me enough, you know that I am not necessarily an orthodox, um, completely accurate, unless it's really glaring. So I, li I like to change things a little bit to my own design, and I accept little inaccuracies as just part of the drawing process, because again, we're not measuring and we're we're drawing and we're analyzing. So you'll you'll get used to that. But I do want to go one more past dark here. I think her hair's, her hair's pretty dark. I bumped the contrast up on the image a little bit. Um, and it flattened out the hair a little, so we want to give a little more expression to the form of the, of the head there. But ultimately, I think it still works. But that's my thinking on that, so you'll know on the, um, on the hair in the back of the head a little bit there. So moving over, coming around the other side here. Just, you know, it's, I'm not thinking about a lot about different values. I'm keeping it relatively simple here. I'm thinking it's more just one value. Of course, I'm looking at value shape and, and 
making sure I'm in the right area of what I'm looking at. The back of her cranium. Filling that in. There's a little spot where her hair ends in the back of her neck and it gets just perceptually a touch lighter. Of course, we'll get into that all later in its time. It's probably what you're learning about academic traditional drawing, if you will, is that there's very much a procedure, not so much with expressive drawing that depends on the idiosyncrasies of the artist, which is very can be very exciting and can give you some really fresh and interesting creative results that you, you might, you certainly won't get with procedural way, but if you're just learning to draw, I think the best way to learn to draw is to start with traditional material in, in, in techniques and stay there until you're, you have a healthy grasp of it. And then well, many artists stay there for their life, which is totally fine, or you start to really get bored or you want, you, you ask the question, what else is there? Are you interested in other, other movements of art or, or trying to create your own art movement, which is what art history really is about, is, is trying to find a breakthrough, which is very, very difficult. And just kind of toning back the ear. It's a little lighter than the hair. Part of it's even lighter, but getting part of the helix area, the top of the ear, that double helix Y shape. You can't really see it here. Just feeling that in very simply. Again, what I, I, I caution you by be careful going in too deep with your photo image, max, you know, blowing it up to maximum um, I, you know, close up. Um, I didn't really do that here, uh, nor did I did do that at all. But I do give you some close ups in the back of these videos for this for this drawing. But just be careful because it can it can be a little dis disconcerting uh, in that ultimately, if you're drawing from life. Again, you're only going to stay within a, a certain distance from the model. You're not going to be able to walk up to the model and look at their ear cavity or their, you know, inside their nose or their, <laughs> unless you're married to them. And then, of course, I, I make my wife, you know, no, of course not. But you're, you're, um, you're not going to be able to get that close for decorum and for safety reasons and, you know, whatnot, obviously. And so you, you might as well try to mimic um, what that feels like in front of a live model if you're unable to do that. And sometimes you're not in certain countries. They just can't. Like I had a student, uh, uh, Sanjeev Ahmed from Bangladesh, and they just don't have figure drawing much there. And uh, so that's a very difficult. So you have to rely on photos. So just be careful of that a little. Um, knowing that keeping your distance from the model and then working the image for that distance it makes a lot of sense because sometimes you can get you can get too detailed in areas that don't need it that are that should be feel further away and so we want to try to keep our our relative distance and our distance from when we shot Brevin here was probably about eight to ten feet away of course the cameras it's got a little magnification on it. So it probably feels like about six feet away, which is about the, the closest distance you would come, maybe six to eight feet in a, in a classroom setting. I don't think I've ever sat closer to a model that, that I didn't know, you know, personally. So continuing on here with our graphite blocking, you know, being being uh, really mindful and careful to be very consistent with the surface stroking of the graphite pencil. You don't want to go too dark or too light, but right, kind of right at this half halfway point of blocking in the shadow shapes of the value here. You're running over the shoulder and some of the deltoid scapula area here. We're just all going to group that together. Nice and clean. It's a very clean type of drawing style. <clears throat> I'll go right through the back there. And sometimes I'll go further out of the lines there. 
I'm going to, I'll just erase that out. I'm going to leave the back of the model contrasting against the white paper. So that means, I'll get my microphone closer here. So that means that, see how I just erase that off? That means that I can just go back and erase that. And it'll be more contrast back there, that darker back shadow against the light of the paper just to set off a, a, um, a value effect. So sometimes I'll draw over the lines. It's kind of like coloring outside the lines, if you will. And then therefore, I can come back and just erase erase over those lines easily. That way I can get um, the value nice and even all the way through the, the, the end of the back. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll do that. It makes it uh, easier. You could just erase off. Some, some materials you can do that with. Other, other materials or other styles you can't. So I'm waving myself cut here. So I'm back here. So I just sometimes if you see me waving, I'm just telling myself to cut. Um, when I narrate, sometimes I'll just leave them in just for fun. But I, I uh, needed something to balance my hand on to get this tone down, and I had to, I got a little piece of plastic protractor here to to lay my hand. I'm not measuring anything. I'm just putting my hand on that so I don't get the paper dirty or also the part of the drawing down by the the buttock of the model, buttocks of the model, so I don't smear that around. So keep that drawing really clean. And you know, my stroking pattern and direction is important, kind of curving around her arm and her, the back of the shoulder, now the lower back uh, by the scapula, and just following that shadow pattern. And you can see I give a little stronger emphasis where the core shadow is, but not a whole lot. You want to get yourself where, in your drawing, where you're most comfortable with your hand movements, even if you have to tilt or change the paper direction. You've seen me probably do that if you've been working with me quite a while. Um, I don't try to do it too often unless I really need to uh, because I, 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 it takes a lot of camera work to, to do that and a lot more editing. Right here to here, the armpit, the back of the pectoral as it curves up to attach to the, the humerus notch there. On the other side, so we get that arm. A little discoloration where the hair has been, underarm hair, like we all have, has been shaved there a little bit. <clears throat> I'm just going to work our way through this, through this tone. <clears throat> You can see me move around the camera to where I want, and I'll take my eraser and clean up little areas that I want if I overdraw. I'm trying to be as fairly precise with this technique. Other techniques, if it's gestural, um, can be can be changed. <clears throat> and that means if you're going to do something gestural, you can make a lot of abstract kind of errors and live with them and that might give the drawing more power. Here we want to be fairly pretty accurate. I do make some changes with the feet and the legs just for effect for my own design. But otherwise it's, it's fairly accurate. Go back and tighten up that line there on the chest. See how the breast starts to hang off the pectoral there and then come down and then teardrop shape out. Clean that up and through there. <clears throat> Getting around the top of the brass, a little value as it turns over and towards us, you can see the light, and then as it attaches to the pectoral on the side, it gets a little darker, or it gets more of a slight soft crevasse, and then as it gets even darker, that's more of a turn, and it, and it uh, attaches even tighter and lower there with that cast shadow. And a little reflected light. You can see the reflected light right after the core shadow. Basically, the breast form there is kind of an oblong egg, teardrop egg form.
<clears throat> and put a little dot mark there under the breast just to really turn and hold that chest to the breast make it feel really like distinctive separate parts go a little darker here it's kind of a triangular shape where that breast form underneath the breast form with that cloth is again I'm not mimicking the cloth we're going to draw the cloth at all I'm just going to put value down there but I am going to mimic some of the value tone and also ad lib and go darker when I want to and it's another thing about drawing once you master several different techniques you can start to ad lib things that you might normally wouldn't give your permission yourself permission to do that's something that I've noticed about um, my students and also YouTube uh, land students a little bit is that they'll they need permission to, to do certain things and you you don't have to have anybody's permission to do you know changes or, or what you want you just have to be confident and a little bold I suppose um, and you 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 do them you do want to follow rules for a while for sure to get concepts down and then what you do with those rules are, are up to you. It's kind of like music. If you've studied music, you study scales. Like I play guitar and you study different scales like major and minor you know, scales and, and pentatonic blues scales for those of you that might know a little bit about that. And then once you get them under your finger, the different shapes and different keys where they're at on the fretboard, it's you don't keep playing scales. You start to improvise with you know, rhythm and, and, and chords and things. So same thing here, once you you learn how to draw pretty well, you can start to um, ad-lib and improvise. <clears throat> Just tightening up the breast form around the nipple area as it, it flows a little bit upward. We'll bring that out later as we finish that off after our stump pass in a while. Sometimes again, as a, as a basic lay-in, I, I know there are areas that I'll go back and and um, retouch and and make more congruent, like her her face, nose, and mouth. But for right now, that's enough that I need. I don't necessarily have to finish that off completely. I'm I'm a real stickler for myself when I draw about keeping a, a strong procedure and not making any any one area too finished. Now when I'm ad-libbing, that, that's not always the case. Some, some artists do that as a natural kind of rule or right for themselves where they ad-lib or they finish areas out before they even might even lay in uh, part of a form. Lucian Freud did that. He, he didn't even do a basic under, underdrawing. He just started painting. He did a few, few lines and shapes and then started painting, but he was really concerned about it being a painting and painted from start to finish and not a drawing. Um, and it, obviously here that's different. But when I'm doing real academic kind of traditional work, which this certainly is, we want to keep order and balance all over. And then, you know, contemporary, post postmodern contemporary art and the figure can be balanced, but it can also be very um, unbalanced in the sense of how an artist arrives at getting to a finished conclusion, which makes um, makes makes art exciting in this century, and we won't know where we're we're fall if we're really mannered if we're not um, after some long time of art historical reflection. But point being is that different solutions can be had by changing up the process, and so once you learn processes or processes like like this one or any of the techniques in the drawing database then you can start to ad-lib if you want to. If not, then you can stay with, with um, a more traditional kind of, kind of look there. And so the, data, the drawing database will always be more just traditional. The, it's hard to teach ad-libbing on a YouTube kind of platform. So, and that's, that's what art school is for, to help with that. Getting that cast shadow 
lay it in. Not too dark. We'll go darker with it when the other values are added around it. But that's where the the darkest part of that breast touches the rib cage and the underlying part of the underlying pectoral. The breast will hang lower than the pectoral, but touching against the abdominal rectus uh, abdominis muscles and in the rib cage here certainly um, and, and that's that area where they touch and then some of the breast is casting a shadow but it's awfully dark there because it's it's around the turn of the form there and so we get that point where the form completely ends so it's going to be a little darker there and you notice how it lightens up as we go higher up the breast to the chest there You can see I've got some lines where I want the shadow to fall on the rib cage. There's a little bit of the ribs, probably the 10th and 11th ribs. Um, just, just making an appearance there. They kind of arch down and curve around. It's kind of a V-shape as well. And that'll help me locate the shadow patterns. And I'm getting a little tone back on the breast now. So it turns around. I move my position a little bit to help me. Turn that form. There we go. I'm going to come by, pass by here and get a little bit of that reflected light by adding the core shadow just a little bit there. And then we'll stump it later on, all of this together, um, towards the end of the back of this video. We'll see how that looks, that, that blending look. <clears throat> it's kind of analogous to kind of a blended painterly, painterly look. It just takes a little time. You have to be patient and hang in there. It's a pretty slow video, but you can work along and stop the video and maybe catch up a little bit too as well. But it's got to be a very slow process of careful analysis and careful laying down of graphite so that you get the desired academic effect that you want. So very clean, precise looking graphite uh, work there. back and reconstituting that edge, constantly looking at the edges. It's a lot of work to know that you're going to do this and then you're going to stump that and blend it all out, but you've got to, you've got to go through this process to get there. Don't take shortcuts. Um, that's one thing I, I want to get across is don't take the long road, the well-traveled patient road. So if you're not very patient, this is probably not a technique for you. More, you're probably more gestural which is fun. I, I, I love that too, but I like doing this from time to time. It's kind of disciplinary challenge, if you will, too. I'm going to get that little coarse shadow there to turn that breast around where the darker part is. And then we also get, again, the two for one, you get the reflected light too. And then you get that cast shadow, which works nicely. the name of the game is kind of uh, quiet discipline. 
Some areas take a long time and some areas don't. When you get large, big shadow shapes, they're not so bad. It's the detailed areas of the head and probably the chest and you know, fingers a little bit that might give you a little bit more fits. That little, little bit of shadow tone back here, a little back behind her ear. <clears throat> There's a little darkness into her armpit where the the lat kind of comes underneath the pectoral in that area. It's on the left side, kind of right there. Yeah, perfect timing. A little, I'm gonna make that a little ultimately in the drawing a little darker than it is, and that's a good another ad living thing just to emphasize that turn further where the arm kind of ends in the side of the rib cage of the chest is. It's kind of the other part of the pectoral and a little bit of the teres major and minor areas. They kind of come around and underneath roughly. And again, light expression now to the rib cage and chest there on the lateral side here. <clears throat> It's kind of interesting how the camera reads a little bit lighter and then I step away and it goes a little darker. I don't know how that that happens, but it, I guess it, it reads the skin of my skin and hat a little bit. <clears throat> and I'm always cleaning up my drawing around. Anytime I see smudges or anything I in the outside of the drawing or on, on the, the drawing of Brevin anywhere, I, I immediately try to take it off. And it's like doing how your house maintenance, you know, cleaning your house and <clears throat> you know, cleaning up after yourself after dinner or making your bed or cleaning the your laundry. Kind of that's how I think about it. Just keeping your drawing clean when when it's appropriate to do so. Other times other artists and other processes are not meant to be that way. They're meant to be rough and chunky and this is accurate and light and um, clean. I'm just now toning in the shadow shape from the back. See, I can go faster. It's a larger area. It's more general. Just adding my tone. I'm not pushing down on the pencil very hard at all. It's a very light touch, and I build it up. See how I draw past her back a little bit? So I can get that to cover her back. And then I've already got a line there, and then I can take my eraser and just whoop. That nice kneaded eraser, which is fairly clean. I keep it pretty clean, and I keep kneaded erasers only for the material that I'm using. So I have kneaded erasers for charcoal, and then I have kneaded erasers for graphite, and then I have kneaded erasers for maybe um, pastel pencil if I use that in any way, shape. I don't really use that often except for gesture drawing. And so that means that they won't interact together because they don't really mix well. Um, for academic work, but non non traditional work, you can you can mix charcoal and, and graphite to some interesting, weird kind of effects, some strange kind of effects. I'm just going over the back here. You can see the nice coarse shadow as the light ends or terminates. The shadow begins, and that generally is going to be the coarse shadow, which will be the darkest part of the shadow. And it's very, it's much darker, right? We can see that. But it's also a soft edge on both sides, on the light side of it, and also the darker side of it. And so you have to be mindful of that. You can't have, it's a banded kind of look, which we want, but it, it cannot be hard edged, like the outside of the form is. A lot of students will do that and make that edge either uh, too hard or the the coarse shadow a little too dark, or they'll miss the coarse shadow altogether. It, it, it's not really illuminating. Once you get the coarse shadow, you get that illumination, that pop, that magic, if you will, 
the turning of the form, the graceful turning of the form from one direction like a barrel around the rib cage, like an egg form. And you know, that's what you look for when we draw the volumetric figure. Um, you know, when we did this drawing the lay-in with graphite, and I'm giving myself a cut here, hold on. So point being was, I had to get cut there, is that um, we didn't use uh, gesture or the volumetric figure on the paper, but we did in our mind. I certainly did in my mind. You got to do that. You can't. You can't. You can't get a three-dimensional drawing going without doing that. And that's the magic of the tricks, if you will. I don't like saying tricks so much, but those are the techniques. That's a better word of what what we see from the the world of art history, from the Renaissance, the Baroque, all the way up, really until post-impressionism, really past post-impressionism, was still, of course, there was some relaxing of that, but the use of gesture, rhythm, movement, and the volumetric figure. So if you don't see it in the drawing or painting, the artist is still thinking about it. Regardless of who they are, where they're from, where they're from, that's how the human mind works. And we're still using that, even if it's not on the page. But when we teach it, we teach that pretty hardcore to, to show the work so we can see the work. That's part of what I do as a professor, besides being a professional artist myself, is obviously to teach, but teach our students to be inculcated and show their work so I can see exactly what they're thinking and how they're getting or not getting to better to a point of uh, their drawing. That's, that's terribly, terribly important. So if you're a, uh, an instructor, high school, uh, a whatnot out there, um, make your students show your work. That will be helpful for them and for you. And it will be get into their, their work. And then later on when they've mastered that, you don't necessarily have to show. And what I mean by that is not showing the construction lines or the gesture or the, or the, the boxier forms. And it's all mental process processes and most of the time yeah you know, I've said this a lot it disappears when you when you finish a painting or a drawing out in a more academic or traditional way and some artists like to show that more more modern or contemporary uh, art art and I think that's also a, a very handsome kind of look so that's what I mean by that too now you can see I worked through the buttock down to the leg and see how I've overdrawn and just come back with my eraser and pick it up. This is a good technique to learn is to, you know, if you're if you're silhouetting um, or you're contrasting the back of the model, we're not gonna draw the drapery. It's too too that would be too long a video. And it's pretty busy back there, quite frankly. And so um, we'll just leave the shadow alone against the white tone of the paper, but we you know we don't want to overdraw too much so we can just erase that out and let the nice edge quality and the value itself contrast against the, the white of the paper. And then on the, the uh, lit side or the left side of the model, we'll use some atmosphere uh, ad-libbed or made up against the light of her, uh, uh, of her skin tone on the model and we'll get a nice contrast there as well. So it's a nice little, little sub-technique that you wouldn't necessarily get if you didn't watch the video all the way through. You know, when I'm an NKU teaching, sometimes I think I should put like little coupons or passwords in the videos. Um, so when my students do their do their their homework, their drawing technique homework or their anatomy homework, they have to, sometimes it, <laughs> I know that they just they go to the end of the video and they just draw that. I know they do. Some of them do. Some of them don't. And I can I can kind of tell, but I feel like I need to put like little code words in there so, <laughs> so that they. They, and they have to write the, they have to find the code word or a little flash of color or something and it, uh, when it comes up so I know that they're, they're paying attention I can bury it halfway through the drawing through two or three times but it, I'm not that hardcore it's, if either you're gonna learn it or you're you're gonna you're gonna uh, half half do it and so there's nothing I can't stop them I can only grade them so it's kind of funny that way little little fun parts of being in you know an art educator professor in the in the arts as well those of you that teach if you're watching this you know what I'm talking about for sure maybe your students are watching with you you can all have a giggle 
So, yeah, just getting the subtleties now in the abdomen here. It's not, you know, it's not the, the tone of the paper. It's got a little value. There, there's not, it doesn't have bright, bright highlights. Maybe some on the nose tip. So you want a little bit of that paper to show through. That's hard for people to understand is that the, the lighter side of the model usually has lighter form shadow, meaning that it's not completely um, absolute light, which would only be highlights. And only those areas of the model that are receiving light at a 45 degree angle where they're at a 45, so they can receive it um, straight, kind of straight perpendicular, if you will, and that will give you the uh, very bright highlight. So I'm just kind of touching up there for a moment. I'll come back down here. So again, just to prepare yourself, when after we stump, um, after the block in stage of your graphite, because you need you need tone to to have something to stump, right? Um, and, and I suppose you can keep your stump very dirty with graphite and do that, and you can do that, but I, I prefer to show you this way first. It's a little bit cleaner, more accurate way. But after we stump, then we're ready to go back with the same process that we're doing now with graphite, and then, of course, we'll uh, really get to a finish. And I'm not going to finish the whole thing. It would just take too long. But I'm going to get the head up the arm to the fingers and then down to about the middle buttock and let it fade on both the top and bottom. And that will give you a really good uh, demonstration and, and lecture there. And then of course you can finish it if you'd like or you can say, okay, that's good enough and now I wanna go on to my own and repeat the process uh, with your own pose or pick a po another pose that I've, I've given you. And uh, I think what I'll do, I'll tell you what, in the, the final video, that um, when we when we do the finished part after the stump, we come back. I'll put about four or five more poses with Brevin at the end, and then you guys will get some extra poses you could work from too, if you'd like, or you can always choose your own. Use Croquet Cafe; they're they're great. They're they're wonderful. They have great poses too. New Masters Academy. That's a pay side. New Masters Academy. But they have they have great great poses too as well. It's a that's a wonderful website if you're looking for further instruction. And I encourage you not just don't let me be your own only instructor. Um, that's that's um, you need more than one uh, in, in mentor instructor. And I, I highly encourage you uh, to check out New Masters Academy. Uh, some of my old professors when I was in Los Angeles studying at Art Center College of Design in Pasadena uh, were teaching there and then um, years after I graduated. Uh, matter of fact, within the last eight, eight years or so, they formed Glenn Vilpoo, Gary Meyer, Steve Houston, they, they formed New Masters Academy uh, as a way to, um, more than likely, foster really good drawing in an academic kind of environment and probably make a, make a little money too uh, as well. Maybe they were also frustrated with the high cost of art schools these days, which can be exorbitant. Let's cut down. There we go. We can actually see that now. What a revelation. See how I've overdrawn there on the left side? Yeah, I might leave that. It was a quick gesture, but here we're going to go be a little cleaner with it. And it's got a little bit of light coming off that gastrocnemius of the calf and a little bit of the lower soleus down to the to the uh, inner ankle there, the medial ankle. Cut for a moment here. There we go. Going back now, we're going to block in more tone now on the abdomen and lower leg. Right, this part of the leg right there, right up against See that where it, where it goes vertical and kind of straight, curves a little bit? That's called the three-finger gap. You can put your three fingers on your, that space in your leg. Try that. Have your students do that if you're, if you're a teacher, instructor, in, obviously in clothing, jeans, um, and, and have them raise their, their knee up uh, parallel to the ground, their, their, uh, their thigh. And you'll see that your arm, your fingers won't be pinched or pinched. And that's a little straighter area. That's where the sartorius and the um, part of the vastus uh, medialis 
need some space to curve around your leg on the inner inner thigh. You can see it on the, the right leg a little bit with a shadow is that you, they need space there. So that helps. That's called the three finger gap. And uh, Glenn Vilf, Vilpu was the first person that taught me that when I was in LA a long time ago, back in the 90s. Doesn't seem like a long time ago. Time keeps moving and I'm like, that seems like it was yesterday. The hair's a little grayer. Muscles are a little stiffer, but keep on keep on moving. It's like, wow, okay. That was 20 years ago or so. Anyhow, point being, that's the three finger gap. So I'm just ad-libbing some of the tone. I'll go back, see how I catch that line with the graphite. I'm not heavily outlining. I don't want it to be too heavily outlined. I'll tell you when I'm doing that. I'm doing, I did it, I will do it on a little bit of the breast and the, the head a little bit just to play off line and value. I like line and value, a little flattening, but a little tone. It's kind of the more, um, late late 19th century impressionistic slight kind of uh, feeling Degas Manet he was probably Manet was probably my, my favorite impressionist although you know he was a more forward-thinking more concept it's got impressionistic technique and he, and he painted and drew the people of the day, which was a very strong departure. People forget that. They just see the optical part, but it was also the drawing of, of everyday life in, in Parisian setting, and it wasn't, you know, historical, mythological kind of painting, which was, which was Romanticism and um, Neoclassicism. Anyway, let's go down to the foot here. I'm rambling, sorry, and we'll just block in a little shadow tone on the foot here. Just thinking about the side plane of the toe. They're just little box forms. We're going to keep those feet simple. Don't get into a lot of, don't be drawing nails on the, the toes and um, keep it simple. Maybe even more simple than I had it. It could be a little bit more blocky, but put a little shadow tone on the ground where she's sitting underneath the foot there. So it's a little bit of an arch where that dark is. And we'll kind of move that shadow. I'm just playing off what she's doing a little bit how she's perpendicularly stanced see how her left foot here the one i'm right on now is straight and the other one's almost really perpendicular to that and i push the heel back just a little bit just to play off a little bit more movement and i'll put a little shadow tone back here nothing fancy it's making a cast shadow there and we'll get the heel the calcaneus area, which is a fascinating area to draw if you don't know anatomically, anatomically about that, the Achilles heel and the soleus uh, tendon attached to that ending point of the calcaneus bone about halfway down. And then right underneath that tendon is a little bursar pad. Um, I didn't know this until I really started studying anatomy um, in school and then slightly after. It's a little pad there. It's like a little piece of, you know, silicone rubber and that tendon lays on top of it so it doesn't rub so harshly against that bone. If you've ever ruptured your Achilles tendon, I've, I've stretched mine, I haven't snapped mine, wow, is it devastatingly painful and it's crippling to you until you get that repaired or you lay off of it. You can't really move much uh, without it. I've seen athletes on television I like American football. I played American football when I was in high school and school, and I've seen one rupture on camera, and it's devastating. The entire gastrocnemius so of the calf and the soleus basically do a large kind of spasm. They shake and they shimmy. It's basically like taking a rubber band that was you know already stretched, and then having it break. If you've ever had that, it pop back on you a little bit, and it's very painful for the athlete. So, a little tidbit there. Hope they didn't gross you out too much. And just coming down the leg now, and I want to get the back of this line um, refreshed here. If I lose my line, I'm going to go back and catch it. Just see, I'll just take that, catch that a little bit. Get that little. I've got just a line or two for the platform. Uh, and make sure you get that angle right. You know, we're above the model slightly, looking slightly down, and so that's the proper angle for the platform. So make sure it's not too wide. You know, a lot of times you can take the corner, as I'm blocking in the foot, I'll talk about the platform here. See, I'm keeping the block in simple. Let me talk about the foot first. 
basically just shadow tones where I see them. Each toe is like a little block and we're toning in the right side because the, the, the light's a little bit to the left and to the top. The platform, that angle, that curve, that uh, diagonal angle where it points, if the center point of that line, think of it as the center of a clock, what time would that be? Well, the shorthand is probably about 4, so it's about probably 4.40 in the afternoon, or it could be in the morning. So that's one way you can think about those little um, angles, in pers but I just think of them as pers perspective lines. Now I'm toning in a little bit of the background here just to show the platform off. This is just a design thing. Um, totally my own and made up. I'm taking my hard edge and giving, it's hard to see there, my noggin's in the way. Hope you like my, my winter beanie hat there. Anyway, that gives us um, the corner of the wall there, and I'm not going to go highly detailed, but I want to kind of move around the background just a little bit down at the bottom with the cast shadow of our feet and also a little bit of the uh, wall uh, plane change that we have there just so that we can move the eye around a little bit as we come down to the bottom to the feet just for a little variety to give a little bit of interest down there. Not too much because we don't want to take off the, um, the interest of the head, the shoulders, and what ultimately will be the focal point, that area in the rib cage and, and abdomen and chest region for our final here. Putting a little bit more tone, there's a little shadow there. You could put this whole side of the foot almost in shadow. It almost wants to be. There's a little light sneaking out there, just a touch of it. <clears throat> okay, I think we're just about ready to stump. Now we'll go back to the head and I'll touch up a few things and get ready for stumping. So about 10 more minutes or so of just tweaking and detailing out a little bit more tone on the face. She's a little too bright where I've got her, so we'll go a little bit darker under the chin, jaw area, the mandible here to get to the neck and then around the mouth a little bit. So I have to be really careful here not to be too harsh, very light tone, because that's going to be blended a little bit. Blending the stump will uh, lighten up the darks and will darken the lights a little bit. It will move everything, if you're not careful, to kind of a gray middle value. So when we use the stump, I'll talk about that and I'll show that fairly close up how that can change your drawing in good ways and also frustrating ways if you're not careful. And when I do use the stump, it's a very gentle technique. I'm just barely pushing, uh, pushing down on the, on the paper and so it's very, uh, very a, kind of a light, almost kind of a feathery touch. You can also use a, a, a brush as well, a, a, a paint brush or some nice, you know, kind of soft, tiny brush or different sizes to stump uh, a little bit. When we say stump, basically we're meaning blending and not necessarily with the finger. You know, blending can be a no-no in, in the, the early beginning stages of learning to draw. I see students that come in and they like to finger smear a lot, and, but and it looks bad. They don't know exactly what they're doing. They want that soft look, but they don't know how to get it with the tools. And so I try to take that away from them pretty quickly. So if you're a teacher, uh, I, would, I would at least suggest that until they become really adept at using the tool, tools, and then they can stomp, uh, certainly, and if they want to do gestural things with their fingers, or they get adept, and they know how to balance mark making with the tool like I'm doing now with the stump. Uh, or finger blending or, or uh, feathering, if you want to call it that, or using a brush, and then you really get a very solid look. And it's riddled throughout art history, a soft atmospheric approach with some tonality on top of that too as well, which is, is just so important. So just be careful of that. There you go. You see I get a little bit of tone now on the face, and it's not quite so, so uh, bleached out a little bit. We'll go back and hit a little bit of the nostril here. We'll pick into the nose there. Pun definitely intended as we uh, <laughs> go through the nostril here. Poor Brevin. She was an excellent model. She's a fantastic kid. Really liked working with her. Probably wouldn't care that we're picking her nose and drawing here. She's got a little nice little beauty mark, a mole underneath just this nostril a little bit. We'll get that into there. In a few, one spot on the chest and a few... Uh, 
darker spots on the um, abdomen. You can get those in there. I usually get things like that around the end. I don't get too concerned with that. And you can always leave them out too as well. Just getting that shadow a little closer to the edge of the nose. There's light hitting that nose coming through as well. All right, continuing on. Just tightening that area, getting a little bit more, giving it more attention, obviously. A little, little spot in there where the shadow is slight on the, the uh, brow of that nose or the shaft of the nose coming down because we're she's facing into the light, but we're getting a little bit a little bit of shadow there on the shaft or the septal part of the nose and then also the nostril in there too as well. <clears throat> Pick up any dirt you can with the eraser as much as you can, any kind of smudging. I'm going to keep this drawing clean. Part of, part of I think the challenge if you're fairly new to drawing is going to be to keep your drawings cleaner, especially when you work in a very tight or more precise kind of, kind of way. It's not quite as loose or gestural and and maybe it's kind of uh, uh, aesthetically sharp for uh, you know, gesture drawing to be kind of you know, loose. Here you have to be careful about all the, all the parts of, of the paper here. Even the outside too as well. <clears throat> so I moved over on the other side to get a better position for me to get clear up this space a little bit. This will all be smoothed down a little bit. It's, we're going to fill the grooves of the paper. Uh, again, the, the paper will have peaks and valleys and we're going to fill that those grooves in some with the stump and that'll give it a softer kind of painterly effect. So now I'm getting a little shadow. Can you see the shadow on the face there a little bit on the cheek right by the the light of the arm and we'll lighten part of that up later. A lot of times I'll over, again, I'll overdraw areas and then go back with the eraser and just bring out those areas that were lighter. It's easier to do it that way than trying to pick apart or around you know a drawing. I used to do that all the time when I was younger as a kid and then I learned in art school in Los Angeles and beyond to to draw over areas and then you can you can also uh, by erasing tighten up the the uh, lighter areas too as well it makes that the drawing your drawing practice a little smoother and overall a little, little quite easier, but it's more additive subtractive too as well. So just getting in more of the place in the lips. You know, it's so, it's so subtle here that you're just looking for shape, but I'm not only thinking about shape here, I'm thinking about her, the quality of her state of expression, kind of like, you know, state of mind, but you know, what are the lips doing? They're just, they're just, they're relaxed. You've got, they turn down towards the node of the cheek, a cheek with a cheek and the jaw in the mouth gather where that end of the lips kind of turned down where we can see a little bit of light on that node a little bit. Camera camera pick, picks it up a little lighter and when I back off my hand you can see a little bit better. Getting that core shadow under the jaw a little bit further there where she, you know, the lights uh, not hitting the jaw it's turning down into the throat into the digastric re region. You can see how that gets a little more subtle there with some of the dark areas. And so we'll finish up here by just extracting a little, sub subtracting uh, a little bit of the back of the head, the hair there a little bit. We'll take care of all of that with the stump, especially the back part of the hair. I'll be a little bit more painterly with that uh, cardboard stump here too as well. But just getting a little position of where that the hair kind of ends, where the back of her skull, her occipital region of the skull kind of curves and sort of curves back into the neck a little bit and in, in tightening up with the Japanese Amano eraser. It's a pretty small eraser bit. You can see how tiny it is and it's fairly firm um, on that paper and you can see how I can get into the lighter area on the light part of the nose and kind of take that off a little bit which is very nice to do. And then those little little erasers um, come in a packet and you can take a piece of sandpaper pad and, and, and carve them down a little bit to a finer point as well if you don't have a, an electric eraser, which I, I love to use electric erasers. 
just getting that shape where I want it with respect to the eye and the cheek and the jaw, a little bit of highlight or lighter air that's going to be on her, her front part of her chin there. We'll get that through a little bit. So, you know, taking, we take great pains to make a very uh, accurate, tighter drawing. It's a, it's a, it's a longer process. So here we are now to the stump. Hallelujah. So I kind of, I kind of started at the wrist here. I, I, um, I let the, I cut the video where I start with the hand because the hand's still too big, and I'm going to change it um, later off camera. But uh, here I am now. Let's get in there closer and take a look at what this looks like. Here we go. Get in nice and tight there. You can see how that's starting to smooth out now. I'm using a fairly clean stump for now. It'll get dirtier, and I like that. And sometimes I don't when I when I need it to keep it light. So I'm just blending. I'm barely pushing down and blending that through. You can see the detail of the fingers, and those will subtly kind of fade a little bit, kind of get glossed in there and kept really simple. And I'm just going um, slowly blending with the form. Here's a good shot of that where you can see that smooth in. Most of the time, you know, in certain areas you can leave that look, but you're going to you're going to need drawing over the top of that to make it really work. Just blending on its own is probably not going to get it. Maybe in the hair a little bit of the Dega image that we looked at will work, but by and large, you're 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 going to need to draw over that and through that a little bit uh, further. Pop in a little bit. I'll try to pop in and out to see the whole picture a little bit. Just like we normally do when we draw. And you can see how close I'm getting and how just barely pushing down with those, those fat sausagey fingers of mine. So it's not a very uh, uh, laborious kind of process. It's very soft and it can just go fairly quick, but it's controlled. I'm not going too fast. Now, did you see me swing out there? and change it. I wanted to not get too dark there, so uh, what I did was I flipped it over and started to work on now the background tone back there. And see how it's, it's when I blend it, it's going a little darker, right, than what I put down. Also, if it's really dark and you start to use that stump, it's going to go a little lighter. So what that stump does, it has a graying effect. Darks get a little lighter, lights get a little or sometimes a lot darker. Take a look at now. You can see the big difference now in the stump between the stump area, stump areas, and also the drawing of, of the, the graphite. So that's pretty important uh, through here. So just cleaning up the hand a little on those edges when you use the stump uh, a little bit there. We'll just kind of roll this. I can keep keep talking. You can admire my beautiful stitched uh, hat here. I forget where I got this one, but. Um, I hope you enjoyed that that wonderful shot of that uh, wool, I think wool kind of yarn cap there. Good to have when you're balding and uh, you live in a colder area and you go skiing. I wear a helmet too when I ski, but when days I ski just lightly, I'll just wear a hat. Okay, back to reality. So we're going to now work with the fingers. See, I'm just toning them in. I'll go back in and tighten them up a little bit further. So it's a process. And I won't include the nails. I'll just include some of the value pattern and just work on the structure and ease off some of that super detail that you get with the images. That's probably one of the biggest weaknesses when you're learning to draw and you're working with images is getting in too close and getting out too far. And so we have to be careful as artists, especially training other artists in in the, uh, the beginning basic techniques of of you know, figure drawing as well as still life, etc. And, and not being live and in front of objects is to uh, don't pan in too close. You could waste your time um, trying to draw every single freckle or every single you know piece of fingernail or fold and that's just not the way things work unless it's a hyper photo real drawing and that's just a real that's really outside the canon of, of art history training even though it's an interesting finish no doubt but it it's something that you don't really aspire to necessarily in training in art school. It's more of an advanced technique of a personal kind of expression. So again, most everything in the drawing database, with the exception of the art historical drawing part of it, is more just basic foundational kinds of drawing practices. So stumping the hair, see how that's smoothing out? It's giving it a nice look there. 
and it's going a little darker. So it makes those middle tones a little darker, but if it goes again, if it goes too dark, it's going to take it down a little bit. So it's not quite at that point where we'd get a little bit lighter or grayed down. But that's a big that's a big nice difference between a really good example of using the pencil, the graphite only, and then the then the stump coming on top of that. You could even draw with the tip of the stump if it's dirty enough and you have enough material, then you'll kind of have to dip it back into graphite. You could either use powdered graphite, or I think probably better is just to rub some graphite on a piece of paper, get it pretty dark, and then every now and then, kind of like a palette, you can go dip into that. So you can draw with this stump. It gives you kind of a blunt, sort of a soft uh, line with the same width of the stump that you're we're working with as well. But again, the, the pressure point on this is pretty light. So you're going to have to take it slow. You don't want to push down too heavy or too hard and dent the paper in. Now later on when you're doing expressive stuff that may call for all kinds of rough, rough ways, go for it. Notice I glossed over the ear there to kind of tone it back. It's in shadow. There's a little lighter ears, but by and large the ear is fairly, fairly in deep deep shadow there there's a little bit of light coming through there's a space between her arm and her head there that she's not resting her her arm her bicep on her cheek there's a little probably an inch inch or so gap and then a, a nice technique here is to kind of just take a little bit of the graphite gesture that I'm using and then just stomp it it's almost like painting so these are nice kind of on the edge of her hair could be finishing strokes later on. I'll show you here in a moment. Um, if the drawing is a quicker drawing, you can be really light and expressive with it. And then you can, if it feels a little out of control, once you get finished stumping, then you can go back with your eraser and you can clean up edges and take off areas that were um, overdrawn, again, like I've talked about a little earlier, which is a kind of an exciting technique, too, as well, to, to use. So again, when we're doing hair here, big rule of thumb is mass, mass and movement. So what does that mean? Well, get the gesture of the flow of the hair, and then get the overall mass of the value, meaning the out, just the whole flowy kind of process. And forget about every single detail will drive you nuts. Only when you come back and you're ready towards the end to get that. See how painterly that can be? How nice when it gets a little bit more focused. Sorry about that camera. Just it is what it is there, it just kind of uh, focuses and gets a little bit out of focus, but we can kind of see the process there. And so it's very painful, I'm just, just blending and stumping, if you will, and smoothing out just very lightly, nothing, nothing especially uh, harsh in terms of pressure, and it gives a nice, nice look. If I wanted that to be my final pass, that would be a nice kind of look at that back of the hair, and I could just uh, draw in a little darker, um, in where the where the hair kind of wraps together in, in terms of a shadow through there. So again, I'll go back and I'll I'll catch that edge if I need of the back of that shoulder. Make sure we get that deltoid curve the way we want it. Lay it looks, and you'll see me take a little off to reconstitute that area. If I if I dip too far into the lighter area, we can take it off and then just draw a little darker later. You can see how that works. Again, I'm using the protractor just as a something to keep my hand off the the drawing. It's not something for measuring or getting angles, degrees. Don't be don't be confused. Don't be fooled by by that. The only time I use a protractor is when I, I'm doing heavy duty linear formal linear perspective. Perspective and I need an angle and three point like you know 25 degrees or something, 30 degrees. And then, you know, when I was in high school in geometry, I think I made B's, A's and B's in geometry, maybe a C every now and again in math, but I did okay. It wasn't my favorite topic. 
You see how that kind of gets wispy now? That's a nice kind of painterly kind of effect. Later on, we'll come back on this with a little graphite tone and we'll give it a little bit more purpose. But it has a nice softening blending effect. So I think some of you out there are going to love that. And again, if you don't have a cardboard stump, you could make one out of paper, cardboard, or you get an old brush or buy it. What I, actually, what I would suggest is buy a clean brush, small and different sizes, maybe like an acrylic brush for acrylic. It's a little kind of stiff, uh, maybe like a, a flat or a filbert tip to that. I don't think a sable type softer brush like for watercolor is going to do you. Something a little stiffer in that you don't care as much about, but you're probably going to have to spend some money on the quality because you want it you want to keep it um, only for that, that practice. If you're using, like I wouldn't suggest, you know, doing an oil painting of whatever you're doing and then, you know, cleaning that off with, with you know, turpentine or turpentine, whatever you're using as your mineral spirit cleaner and then jumping into a drawing that's not going to work. So this, these stumps, again, I separate by graphite. And if I use them in charcoal, they say I separate by charcoal, whatever, uh, whatever media medium that you're using and so that that will help keep it within its own boundary now let's say if you're an ex you're exploring and you're using mixed media and you're do you know you have charcoal and graphite maybe some chalk and paint well then yep use use stumps for only that process mixed media what the great thing is the point of it is is what these things are again paper these stumps and you can take them right on to a notice I switch and change up a little bit you can take them right on to um, a sandpaper pad and sand them down. Clean. You can totally clean everything off, and then also reconstitute it into a fine point. You can also, if you're savvy enough, for those of you, you could take an electric drill or a battery powered drill, and if the stump is small enough, you can you can lock it into the drill shaft, right? Like you would put a, a drill bit. Take the drill bit out, put your stump in, lock it in and then run it over the sandpaper pad at high speed and you can you can whittle that thing down to a really nice fine point and clean it up. I do that all the time. I do it with my uh, uh, electric eraser uh, shaft, my eraser shafts. Not the Japanese model that you see, but my electric, bigger electric erasers. Maybe I should do a little video on that sometime or some way to do that to show you that. And it really saves time and you can really craft your erasers into some very, very fine points. If they're firm enough, if they're soft, they're just going to kind of get mushy and kind of gum up your uh, your eraser a little bit. But if they're firm enough, you're going to be able to, to clean them, which can be important, and then also to uh, have a very fine tip, which can be um, a real a real wonderful tool to get into fine areas through there. So we look at her lip a little bit right on the outside. I, the, the paper is, uh, it, it's textured just enough that sometimes it's hard, even hard to tell. So it looks like there's a little extra there. I'll clean that up when we get down to the final process in the next video as well. But uh, that's just part of it uh, there. So just cleaning up the, the background tone here. And you got a little bit of the image in the way. I'm just going to leave it. You can, we'll, we'll see that later. But you can, you can see what what that's looking like. I want you to make sure you get close enough. You can see. And I'm just ad libbing. I'm not. I'm looking at the yes. I'm looking at the value next to the model there in the background. But we're not doing cloth drapery. It just gets too busy. Quite frankly, would make this video too 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 long. I'm trying to keep these down a little bit. But you know, I want to make sure that you get. A good narration and a good, good lecture demonstration. You can't, you know. It's I see a lot of I see a lot of really good YouTube channels out there, and they're nice. But it's again, it's I get a lot of comments from students across the world saying thank you for the longer videos, and I do, and I and I appreciate that for sure, and I like doing it. But sometimes the narration gets super long, and so I need to cut down just a little bit. I think just for my own sanity. But yeah, I I don't think that a, a fifteen minute lecture is going to get you. You need to see the process all the way through and then you can always fast forward as well. I, I, I like doing that sometimes. Try that sometimes. Fast forward with the video, um, the audio on and I'll, I'll sound like a, 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 a chipmunk and it sounds pretty, or like after drinking a ton of coffee 
which is funny. So I kind of like doing that to myself. I'll make, I'll make my niece and my ne my nephew kind of giggle, or my wife a little bit when they, when they see the videos. So again, look at the difference between the stump, right, and the mark making technique, which is a, which is a fairly um, controlled one. And look what the stump does. The stump kind of blends it. It's like again, like painting. If you're if you've done some oil painting where you put down some material and you take the brush and you blend that brush with a blending brush, you blend that paint and it kind of blurs the problem that you may run into as you over blend. You see that I really don't, I don't, you know, kind of see through that beautiful uh, gray hair and that green and dark green hat that I've got, got going, but you can see that I'm not um, over blending, I'm just getting it smooth and or smooth enough because I'm going to go back on and add that final drawing pass later on, which is so so important to, to get that final finish, good academic look as well. That's a good a good look as we kind of stand back there to see, you know, what that does. And we'll just continue on here to get to the body further as well. <clears throat> here we go down to the to back to the skin tone here. Taking it easy really softening that touch, especially with the skin tone. Look how much darker it's going to make that. It's still in that range where that's going to make it quite a bit darker. Just barely blending that through to the edge with a very light touch. You'll see me stop and look, see where I'm at a little bit, make sure I don't do anything reckless. These drawings are more, much more precise than you, than you, you might normally, you know, do. And so it, it take, you know, look longer, think longer through that as well. It's good training. I'm trying to give you these long poses. I'm going to do several over the year to give you many different technical ways to think about drawing the figure and sketching in a more traditional sense. I won't do really wild abstract you know expressive kinds of things, abstract expressive things. It's just there's no point in it at this point, this stage. So you see that gets a nice blend and then later on we'll come over where the less of the light is and the dark is and they meet on the arm. We'll soften that up a little bit and the final the final run there. We can take the eraser and soften that and then draw over that with the graphite pencil. And so getting down to the end the end of the back there, the split of the spine, over to the shoulder. It's one of my favorite things. I kind of just, just kind of get into a mode and and just start to stump. <clears throat> and you know you can use the stump in a much more faster uh, technical way. Take a look at uh, Adolf Menzel's drawings in the Art History and Drawing uh, section playlist and you'll see that he uses a stump sometimes, maybe even his fingers, to stump or to blend fast, but he, it's never it's never left generally on its own. It's not just everything is stumped out. It's probably not going to, again, it's not going to get it. You're going to have to draw through and on top. I want to really emphasize that, but I think we'll, we'll get to that strong emphasis as we get to the the latter stages with the next video. See how I soften that edge a little bit. We want it too harsh. Just a little softer with the kneaded eraser because later on we'll come back with, with uh, coarse shadow and we'll get that to really turn and soften even further. in the way there a little bit, so we'll just have to wait, come through here, won't narrate too much. 
you can kind of see how I use the stroke and pen. There we go. And then smooth and the nice kind of look or quality that you get to that. That's almost, if you could add a little core shadow, that would be an acceptable almost to finish with just a little drawing more core shadow. You're going to see when I go on top of this, I don't, it doesn't, it's, it starts to get faster. You don't need to draw over area area again. You let the stump blend some where you want and you draw where you want, you know, over that too as well. Let's go ahead and go down the figure a little bit. So let's show them that. Here we go. Now we can see uh, where we're going. Get a little closer, get underneath that armpit there. <clears throat> and then, yes, I'm still thinking about stroking rhythm too as well. The way I run the tip over. Sometimes it's not just the, the tip at 90 degree, but it's tilted over a little bit so I could get a little fatter stroke there depends on, and sometimes I lay it all the way over, very horizontal, so it's very oblique. But ultimately, I rarely push down very hard. It's just blending and smoothing what we've got there. We don't want to go overboard with blending it all the way over to the other, to the light side. We want to keep, right now, the light and dark a little bit more separate. We want to think of them separate so that we can merge them with the core shadow later. So just a little soft smoothing technique, feathering it. It's very, very, very soft. You know, practice this again like like the first video where I or excuse me, the first part of this video where I showed the technique. Do that. Take a piece of paper. You know, those are meant for you to do those too. And in and experiment for an hour or a day before you want to do this drawing. And, and enjoy just abstractly making marks. It's a good view right there. Look at the difference between the two. I mean, I, those are two different kinds of looks. I like both of them. And both of them are very acceptable for, for kind of the aesthetic for an academic drawing. And that's kind of what we're, what we're adhering to. You know, I'm not a purist in any sense of the word to one way of drawing. My career has been multifaceted. So I, you know, I kind of scoff at, you know, a purist kind of formula or formulaic way of thinking but you know if you're if you are going to mimic or work within a technique then you you definitely want to want to make sure that that happens so let's move down a little bit further here so working now we're going to soften up this breast form a little bit and you'll see me overdraw and then you'll see me uh, tighten up the edges and then you can go I can go back and bring about the light right past the areola nipple area and bring back the light a little bit. See how much darker that will get there. So when I when I when we put down a, a tone and we know we're going to stomp, you want to keep it again uh, lighter. You always want to build your lights, your, your shadow tones, which you're working first, generally on white paper, um, uh, lighter than what they're going to be. Up, up to and you can get there by layering rather than going too dark too too quick there and you can see me take now the the kneaded eraser and I've got a little point head to it a little bit and just kind of dab through and see I can bring out the rounded quality of the light there on between the breasts and I'm not looking to get it finished what I'm looking to do is get it into the same same relative look uh, process look where everything is more consistent and that's something that's also different with traditional academic sort of Renaissance Baroque French academic kind of drawing is an overall evenness and completion as you work systematically kind of down the the figure. That seems like it's very scientific. It's not so much scientific as it's just um, observationally clear. And sometimes we don't necessarily do that when we're being expressive. So let's keep going now down the abdomen here, the back of the rib cage, and through to the hip, and all the way down to the to the ground, and to the feet, and to the background, and around the background of the abdomen, and the belly in the front there. Just being very cautious not to, I don't want to take that line off, I just want to soften that line, because there's not real a, a harsh division between the left side of the rib cage in the back and the sacrospinalis muscles on either side, but they are a little darker in the back, you can see that area. And we'll take care of that later. But we just want to get this blended, keep the structure there. Don't get anything out of out of, of whack or harmony, if you will. And 
Just keep on going down there. Stroking through a little bit back up and over for the oblique, back towards the middle, slightly up. It gives some good consideration to your stroking pattern. So whatever generally you probably, you can see some of the stroking pattern that I did with some of the forms there. And I'll repeat that again with the um, stump too uh, as well. Now we'll come back over here to the front side against the light. See me going in a downward motion? The reason why I'm doing that is to get that edge super crisp. It's hard to do that when I do that diagonal stroking pattern. And then I'll go back and kind of blend and diagonal and merge those two. And I'll tighten the line up uh, where it separates the belly from the background or the rib cage from the background. So that's another technique that you can, you can utilize too as well as to um, you know, right as you get to the edge, and don't leave your edges soft. They need to be crisp. Notice I didn't say um, linearly hard edge. You don't necessarily want to outline them, but you want to soften up, you know, the, um, or not leave softened up those edges. Excuse me. Um, you, you want to make sure you bring your tone all the way to the crisp, solid edge and solidify that. That is a big form boundary. The breast, the outer form, of the figures, one of several big form boundaries, and it's a it's a big crisp hard edge one, because the model ends molecularly. We all end at some point, and then the background begins, and that's going to be a value change of some sort. It could be subtle or more obvious, and in, in like in this case, uh, a little bit um, further too. See how that tightens nicely, and we'll, we'll uh, we're getting a design now with the background against the model, bringing that down. And I'm just going to start to finish that out at the bottom too, as I bring down her the back and her abdomen. And and again, it's silhouetted as we want, and we because we're not going to do all of the background, and we're not even going to do all the figure because of the time time constraint on that. But we are going to end the drawing with a. A, a, a technical look that's that's going to be res resolved at least in kind of sketch form. You can see me go in there and work kind of cross hatched. That's an easier way to blend, but you use your you lose your rhythm a little bit, so you have to be careful to make sure you go in that same stroking pattern some. And if you cross hatch, that's fine. It'll blend a little bit easier, but you can you can lose your kind of rhythm, so you have to make sure that that you go back and catch. Continue to catch that rhythm. You can see how that leg is left a little bit uh, blurry. And we'll go back in there with an eraser in a moment, and uh, or I will, <laughs> and, a, and a pencil and tighten up that thigh, that outer thigh too, to get that edge nice and clean. And now we're doing kind of the same thing with the breast form. Underneath, dig out the bottom reconstitute that edge, the bottom, around the top, maybe even bring out the, the nipple. It's hard to see the nipple until you've magnified a little bit. I'm kind of pushed ahead just a little bit as I'm blending the abdomen there. You guys have seen this. You can save a little, little time here, just working through. Going a little faster is a bigger, broader area, so you can kind of go a little faster and looser if you want. Within the within the control of the drawing aesthetic. So just blending that through the, the um, split of the buttock, the butt crack kind of holds there, and you can reconstitute that by drawing. I'm not, I don't try to blend over it and, and deliberately um, eradicate it. We want to keep a little bit and get a little bit better. There we go. See that camera. And then 
I can go with the, the rhythm on the outside. Yeah, there's a little shadow there as those forms are distinctly split, as you, as you know. Everybody's got one of those. Everybody's got a butt there. And then later on that will get more resolved. And we're still in a fairly early block in block in phase. And stumping this through, softening as we go. Side of the leg now. Does it take too long when you've got you get a feel for it? You can get that going pretty quick. See how it just darkens a little bit, but it also blurs a little bit. That's something else um, I haven't really mentioned. It blur blends, but it also gets a little blurry, and that can be good when you want that softness, and it can also be a headache when you want to keep it crisp. Ultimately, you're going to have to go back over what you what you what you stumped or blended. You're going to want to do that. It's not going to be enough. And there's enough art historical examples to teach you that when you look at master studies um, from academies and some of your bigger, the bigger known um, masters of those uh, eras. <clears throat> of that leg. See, I can tighten it up now as so I overdraw, tighten that edge, keep that edge crisp. That's the end of the boundary. So that's going to be a crisp edge, but we're not going to leave it just with just one solid line. The line weight's going to vary to just to just get nice distinguishing qualities to the aesthetic and turn the 3D more. If it's one darker line or one consistent width or value, it's going to flatten her out some. <coughs> we don't necessarily want that for most of our drawing. We use line in tone together, <coughs> excuse me, but that line is going to be consistently varied um, constantly. And we don't know what that, that variation will look like until we draw. It's going to be moving darker, lighter, thinner, thicker. It's going to have a lot of variations uh, to that. <coughs> Just blending through there. It's kind of like, it's almost kind of like watercolor. It gets a little painterly, a little, little um, like a gray tone of wash over the, over the figure. But you know, to make sure you understand there's no water involved in this drawing. Just working our way down the leg here. Just keep on going, keep on blending, being careful. Nothing fancy, <clears throat> but good craft. You're still drawing. It's not mindless. It's never really mindless. You're still drawing. You're just taking that graphite layer you put down and smoothing it out some. Down to the back of the leg, to the ankle, to the Achilles tendon area. And 
And again, you notice how we worked from, from top to bottom. Very systematic and easy to think of here. Here I'm doing the background. I'm, here I'm using, it's hard to tell, sorry, but I'm abutting my edge, so that, that, that protractor, that hard edge, to the, the blending of the kind of just an imaginary wall back there, kind of using that drapery. And it keeps a nice boundary. Watch this when I pull, when I take it off and see how it will keep a nice tight line there. I can do that on both sides and I'm kind of cross hatching to get a direction back towards the angle of the wall there. So moving left and right or more diagonal horizontal than up and down. And I'm just, you know, taking my merry old time and, and getting that little edge that with the hard edge as I pull it off. I'm just, you know, pressing down on the protractor to keep it firm as I abut against the drawing, make a little click sound there as it as it hits against the hard edge. And that gives gonna give you see that nice uh, boundary but we could get there. Isn't that nice? A nice clean edge, just kind of a clean wall. And I can do the same on the opposite side. We'll come down lower and down the bottom and we'll do that. <clears throat> I'm trying to figure out the best way yeah, I want to do this. So now I'll butt it against that edge and do kind of the other side a little too. Really can really want to get that nice clean edge of a wall, kind of a man-made wall there. And I'll go in this kind of direction back and forth. And you could always erase out a little bit to the edge. I think I might do that in a moment too. Just kind of fade, fade this out. This is just a very subjective arbitrary technique of designing just to enough just to give a hint of the background and the ground plane what she's standing on to to give it a purpose there we go and you can see how those edges are kept pretty tight there now just kind of give a linear edge look at make it make that a little tighter like I would with a ruler maybe, and, or I mean a pencil, same kind of thing. Just keep blending that. <clears throat> Go back and catch this edge of the calf a little rounder there. So not too much longer to go for our stumping here. We're almost mercifully, you know, done with with it. And of course, it'll go faster if you when you know, once you're following when you follow along, it's slow. But later on, when you do your own, you get this idea. You can start to go faster with it. It's a lot faster. Now finishing out this leg, this front leg here, and we'll get the bottom of the shadow there. Get all our shadow parts in. <clears throat> and notice the simplification of the feet. There's no um, strong detail on the toes, nails of that nature, just the shadow pattern in the structural thinking of that, that those triangular wedged wedged forms. And we'll blend this a little further. Sometimes you kind of have to reach in odd places to get the stroking pattern you want. You're not turning the paper at home or in your own studio. You can turn the paper any way you want to do that. Here on camera, I'm a little, I'm much more limited. Um, but I've, I've shown that before in different videos where I've turned the paper. Get the back of that knee here. Because the shadow pattern, we've already figured out the shadow pattern. We've already done the hard part of the drawing. 
and this is very painterly it's like laying on the the blocking of a painting it's already kind of underneath there we're just going to smooth it out a little bit down to the ankle and the foot where this is very blocky try and get her blocky <clears throat> against that foot there. Don't want to take that line out, so I'm not going to blend over heavy, heavy. But just cleaning up that shadow, kind of putting that foot in shadow a little bit further than it is. I like that look. Just barely touching up there, hitting those shadow areas. Get that foot to turn down and get, you know, get it. I'm thinking about the structure of the foot, that downward turn, but then also some of the detail, the, the basic structural forms of the foot anatomy too as well that I see and then I also know and we'll catch this other shadow since she's an object just like we all are where we cast our own shadow unless of course you're a vampire then you don't and that's pretty much there get the toes a little bit got about a minute left Let's make sure that we end up with the view of the entire drawing. So toning in those toes there, just getting the shadow shapes of those back through. And let's go back now to a full view, see what we have. There we go. So now we can see it in its entirety. So what a different look it was from the graphite land. But everything is fairly accurate. Remember, I moved the foot a little bit. I don't like the hand. The hand's going to change. It's too wide and a little too long still. So I'll change that. Don't worry about that. So, do, so don't, don't think that that's something I want to keep. I'm going to alter that on my own a little bit. But other thing, otherwise things are, is, things are emerging Excuse me, pretty well here. So we're ready to go on now to the exciting final part, which is drawing over and through. So I'll see you there. Take care. Bye-bye.